It is just a huge, profound honor to be podcast interviewing the legend in my very own house. How cool is that? Michael Schuster. I'm going to read his bio just in case you're living under a rock in Tanzania. Never heard of this guy. Michael Schuster is a seasoned national speaker with a reputation for being honest and to the point. His dedication to the profession of dentistry and the rights of dentists to develop trusting, mutual, respectful relationships in a private care setting without the intrusion of third-party influence is evidenced by the thousands he has helped to create such a practice. Dr. Schuster enthusiastically describes and strategizes for his clients how it is possible to be competent about money, work smarter, not harder, live a debt-free life, create a patient referral driven practice and generate high case acceptance while acquiring an ethical, rewarding and profitable practice. Dr. Schuster believes that dental schools have inadequately prepared graduates to run an organized, profitable small business. He has spent a lifetime traveling, teaching and helping dentists obtain the knowledge and apply the skills necessary to bridge that gap. Michael Schuster is the chief executive officer of the Schuster Center for Professional Development in Scottsdale, Arizona, which he founded in 1978 to teach concepts of managerial excellence, economic freedom, and personal growth. The Schuster Center is a state-of-the-art teaching facility dedicated to increasing the level of health and patient care around the United States by empowering dental organizations to freedom and profitability through overhead control, resource management, effective and efficient organizational systems, and a team that works and communicates successfully with each other and their patients in an insurance-free environment. Dr. Schuster is a 1966 graduate of Marquette University and as founder of the Schuster Center has been involved at the leading edge of dentistry for almost 40 years. He is the only dentist to be recognized as a leading authority in practice development by the Pinky Institute, the Dawson Academy, and the Foundation for Bioesthetic Dentistry. And I can't tell you what an honor it is you're here today. And I got to tell you a story. So I'm 53, and so is my assistant, Jan, who's been my assistant since day one. And when I was in dental school for uh, Creighton and dental school, um, she was working for you. So my first whole career, all I'd ever hear for at least a decade, well, that's not how Dr. Schuster did it. <laughs> that's not what Dr. Schuster says. And he knows far more than you do. <laughs> no, 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 no. So that was, so thank you for made training. You feel, made, made you feel good. Oh my God, you, you, just, you just set her on fire. She thinks you walked on water and all she'd ever do is tell me how uh, I was messing up. And it was smart because I always tell people that, you know, when you're at a staff meeting, if you're the smartest one in the room, you got the wrong staff. And dentists are arrogant and they, they want to be the man. And I'm humble. I'm like, God, if I'm the dumbest guy and I can't contribute to this meeting, my business is going to go someplace. But I want to start off with a very specific question. These dental graduates, they're oftentimes walking out of school saying, um, do you want to be called Dr. Schuster or Mike? Mike, 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 Mike are you Mike. sure? That yeah, just seems yeah, uh, Mike, very arrogant please. for me to call you Mike. <laughs> They say things, well, Mike, you, you, you graduated in the golden years. Yeah. You, 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 you're, you're lucky. They're graduating with 14% uh, uh, of the market is owned by corporate dentistry that has 50 locations or more. Um, the orthodontists are coming out of school and they're saying, uh, Mike, you don't even realize they're, now they're going to send impression material home. They're going to bite in this tray. They're going to send it to Invisalign. Invisalign has now basically bypassed the orthodontist and said, yeah, bite into some impression material. Uh, send it to uh, us. We'll scan the trays and sell you direct. So I want to ask this question. A lot of them say specifically this. I graduated $350,000 in debt. Do you think I made a bad decision? Do you think dentistry, the golden years are behind it? And I made a bad decision going into dentistry. That's a great question. And I would say if I had a son or a daughter, I would want them to become a dentist. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. The problem is, and I think you'd agree, there's a, the opportunity is limited to about 10%. And, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna tell you why I think that is. If I'm $350,000 in debt, and I have a potential of making 30 to 35 or 40 million dollars in a career, that's how I look at that 350. It, it, it's what opened the door for me to have, and same with you, only we didn't have as much debt as they do today, but it still opened the door to a tremendous career and opportunity. The problem that I see for young people, and I talk to a lot of them, you know, I'm, I have phone conversations and people refer people to me, is it isn't the debt that comes from dental school. It's the debt that comes from when they immediately go out and they buy, gotta buy a comb beam. They take a weekend course in implants, they're gonna become an implantologist, now they got a comb beam. 
Then they go out and buy a Cerac. There's nothing the matter with Ceracs, but when you have a comb beam and a Cerac, and then you buy a $70,000 laser, you're twice as much in debt as you were going to dental school. So what happens, what I see, instead of investing in their tech, the technique, investing in themselves, in their ability to sell, or ability to communicate, the ability to build a team, the ability to deliver the technical dentistry, they spend the money on other things. And I, I've said often, um, and it isn't evil, it just is. You trade in an iPhone for a cone beam, right? Well, a, an iPhone, a comb beam is like a thousand times what an iPhone could be. And that's where what happens. They get too far behind the curve of compound debt. They don't invest in themselves. And then they don't really have an opportunity to, to really make out of their profession what they could. That's my opinion. So I, yeah. think, I think there's still a real, a real positive opportunity. I really do. I believe that. Well, a lot of them, well, let me ask you this specifically. Can can they be a high quality family practice um, without a CBCT, a CERAC machine, and a laser? Absolutely, absolutely. Because really, the bottom line, the bottom line is what I don't think we understand. We, we weren't taught this through dental. The bottom line, it's all about relationships. The relationship with the patient is really the key. The and then you could say, well, they do have relationships. Well, the type of relationship that you form with somebody, caring, concern, form a partnership kind of relationship with people where you're, you're so to speak, working together. Let me, let me give you an example. You asked, this is interesting. So I, I become a dentist, okay? And, I, and I, I ended up in a tank in two years and I wasn't in a, I wasn't in a situation we're in today. You go out and you buy all this equipment, you get all this training, and then we come at people to try to do things to them that they don't want. What, what do patients really, really want? What they really want is no dentistry or as little dentistry as possible or as cheap as possible. That's what they want. So here I get all this training, I get all this stuff, and now I come to you and I try to sell you this instead of form a relationship with you to help you prevent the problem. Now I'm trying to treat them. We automatically have an adversary relationship. Huh? And so... When you started, well, you start, what year did you start? I got out of school in 97. 97? 87. 87. Well, so insurance was kind of, there's one generation of it, okay? We've had two generations of dentists that are involved in insurance. And then when I started, there was no insurance, and then insurance was a good deal. It was a good deal. Because a crown was 250 bucks, they had a $1,000 minimum per year, they could do four crowns. Huh? And granted, it only paid 50%, but it's a whole different deal today that, uh, that the insurance is now making the decisions, right? determining the fees, right? making the choices for the patients. And so really what happened is the insurance companies took the relationship away from you and I as the dentist. Okay? So we have to go back and we have to form that relationship with the patient and ask the patient what do they really, really want and really work to help them get it. And that's not what I was prepared for when I went to dental school. And that's not what a lot of us were prepared for people that I see going to dental school today. Well, you know, Mike, when you and I got out of school, um, you just took your fees. Right. You submitted to an insurance company. They pay 100% for right. clean exams and x-rays, 80% for endo and fillings, mm -hmm. half crowns. And then over the next 10 to 15 years, they said, you know what? We're not going to, you're not going to submit your fees anymore. We're going to tell you the fees. Right. And they lowered the fee 40% right. for these PPOs. So the dentists are all sitting out there saying, well, these lines are going the wrong way. The, the, the fees are down 40% right. and 82% of the dentists participate. Right. Yet every time the earth goes around the sun, my staff all want another dollar right. an hour. Right. And so my overhead's going up right. and the fees are coming down. Right. How, how do you fix that? Well, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a bigger, that's a bigger, that's an adult question. That's not, we're not prepared, in, in my opinion. I was not prepared for the world that I faced when I graduated from dental school. I think today they're, get, they're having fewer clinical requirements and they're really less prepared to go out in the world to really offer something that's distinctive, unique, different. How do, how do I distinguish myself? It's just not, and you know as well, I practice in Scottsdale and, and Scottsdale's Glass City. Well, how does anybody know my porcelain's any different than anybody else's? So I think the, the, the bottom line is gets to, I need to learn how to diagnose comprehensive, more complete care. Right? 
I need to know how to establish a relationship with this patient, help them find out what they really, really want compared to where they are, right? so that they get an understanding of where they can go or be if they do treatment or don't do treatment. Huh? And I need, to, I need to work with them. But the way I, what I see when I evaluate practice, and by the way, I am in two dental practices a month. Right? I'm actually there. So it's not like I'm sitting someplace talking about, I actually see what's going on. The, the new patient experience that happens is not, there's no, the doctor doesn't sit down and talk with the patient to figure out what they want. They, they get shipped to the hygienist, they run through that, the doctor comes back, spends 10, 15 minutes doing an exam, talking them into treatment, they go to the front desk, she tries to talk them into treatment, and the acceptance of treatment is less than 50%. 50% of the people walk out of the door. Then they go to all the big technical schools, right? They run off to the technical schools, and they're all about the same. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I know most of them. I'm personal friends with Gary DeWood, John Coyce, Dawson is a personal friend of mine. I love them all. But they go to these schools and now they've got a bigger hammer. But the patient's still coming in in the same place they were before. And they're trying to sell them more dentistry. Huh? And they can't do it. They can't do the quality of dentistry that they're teaching in these technical schools at those 40% discount fees. So the, the acceptance for those boys and girls at that level is about 38. Their treatment acceptance goes down another 10 or 15% because they're still not spending the time to get into what I refer to as a creative relationship. We've been taught to problem solve, right? Find out what's wrong with you and fix it, rather than what's right with you and how can we help you be better. So there's a shift in, in real orientation and thinking. And technical training doesn't do it. Arming myself with all the you know, all the technology, which is great if you can. I have dentists that write checks for those things. Huh? I, have, I have dentists that have cone beams, they write checks for them. I have dentists that have Cerex, and they write checks for them. But a young person that gets too far in debt, I don't know how many young people I talk to. Yeah, I was 350, that number is pretty, three, 400,000 in debt. Then I went out and bought a practice for 600. Then I bought a house for 600. I financed a house for 600,000. And then I bought a cone beam or this and that. Well, they're 1.8, 1.7 uh, million dollars in debt, uh, and they've and they're only they're only three or four years in practice. Now that's not everybody. I'm not saying that's it, but it's a lot of them that I talk to, and they haven't spent any money learning how to communicate, you know, manage their business, learn how to uh, get the technical knowledge that they need. That I don't mean the technical gizmos. I mean really learning how to diagnose and treat a patient. So I think that's what young people are up against. Um, there, there's a marvelous young man that, um, one of my younger, I get a lot of wonderful young people as clients, as students. And he's really on this, if he were here, he'd be saying the same thing. He wants to really talk to young, because he is a young person. And he's invested heavily in his technical education, in his management and communication. And I, I keep saying, okay, you're setting yourself up for the rest of your life. You, you know, whenever you train yourself, whatever you learn, you can take wherever you go. You know, I mean, you could go anywhere with the knowledge you have in practice. I could go anywhere with because I've had that probably. And he's building that in his practice, and he's in the third or fourth year. His practice has just taken off, and he's not. He was in a corporate setting where most young people need to because they got to get a job. Right? They got to go to work. Right? They got to. They've got loans to pay, but. A lot of them don't want to be there, but they don't know how to get out of there. They don't know what's my path to something different. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. But you know, when you're talking about the the relationship okay. deals, um, it reminds me of uh, the natural selection of um, bipolar. When when they started um, diagnosing bipolar, it was four percent in America and it was a half percent in Europe. So everybody thought, mm -hmm. well, they're diagnosing different. And the head. A psychiatrist at John Hopkins made it a career commitment to teach the Europeans how to diagnose it correctly, and he was going over there, and he found out, wow, they only have a half percent. It took him 10 years to figure out, well, for the last 500 years, who would be the most likely Europeans to just say, you know what, screw this country, I'm leaving. It'd be some manic 
bipolar guy. So we had a natural selection. All the bipolars all left Europe and got on a boat, left their shirt on their back, came over here. Dentistry has the same problem. If you go to college and you're well-rounded and you join a fraternity and you make A's, B's, and C's and have a girlfriend for four years, you'll never get accepted to med school, law school, or dental school. But if you're a complete geek like me who sat in the library every, every night at Creighton, I heard the same noise. Ping. <laughs> The library will be closing in 10 minutes. I mean, we were the biggest geeks. Yeah. So now this 4.0 girl who got A's in math, calculus, physics, chemistry, right, biochem, right. she, on all of her friends, they, they think a library is a rock concert. <laughs> And now you're telling them to have a personality and build a relationship and they want to go do a geometry problem. So, and then, yeah, so yeah. how do you, t how can you teach a dentist, a lawyer and a physician to have a personality? And absolutely. Form a relationship? Absolutely. Absolutely. How do, how do I, they, I, that, how do they fake this new skill? That's a great, <laughs> that's a great, you know, that's a great insight. Um, a, a, a friend of mine, a personal friend, a professional died in March. His name was George Land. He was actually in Scottsdale. He was a genius in creative creativity. So they're trying to figure out, I mean, how do we how do we help these people become successful? So they used a, a test for NASA to test for engineers and for whatever, and they applied it to 1,600 children. And what they found is 98% of children under the age of five could create, could be creative in their orientate, bring things into existence. By the age of 10, only 30% could create. By 15, it was 12%. Then they took that same test. By the way, he's on the, George is on, a, on YouTube with this, on a TED Talk. and He died in March, and he, he wasn't in great shape, but he's, he was brilliant. Then, he, then they gave that same test to some 280,000 people, adults. Only 2% could create. So if we look at these, if we look at how we've been trained, if we look at how we've been brought up, We've been, been to, we've been to think, they're trying to put us in boxes. Convergent thinking, not divergent thinking. In other words, so I have, I believe, and I've seen it, okay? Because I I've get, right now, there's five spear mentors in my management program. These guys are top of the world dentists, and yet they still have a case presentation acceptance of 35 to 40% when I see them, okay? And they're frustrated, okay? So I teach them how to create, how to get into a creative orientation instead of a reactive orientation. That happens overnight because creating is in our DNA. We were created to create, finally. Everything that exists from the microphone to the table, everybody had an idea, they created something, right? You know, out of nothing. So in dentistry, you know, we can assemble different things, put things together, Right, and we can create something new. Huh? And when we work with a patient, we can help the patient move towards health instead of just treating the disease. The problem, the major problem, mm -hmm. I see, and it's just my perception, it isn't the perception, is that we were taught to problem solve. And the smarter we are, right, right, mm -hmm. we, we like you say, we get these grades, we do good in school. I was an average student in dental school. I was top of my class clinically, I was middle of my class didactically. So I wasn't like one of those genius people. I'm just kind of an average Iowa boy. And I always tell people, if I can learn to create, you can, because it's in our DNA. So you say, what do you mean create? What I mean is help people first know what they really, really want. People don't move towards anything without a picture. Huh? Without a picture. Okay? So help that patient get a picture. What does health look? What does a healthy mouth look like? What are we taught to do? We're taught to diagnose everything that's wrong with people. Huh? Let's find out what's wrong and fix it. That's to me. That's the primary shift in thinking. Okay? When I see, when I work with dentists, I try to teach them like this long resume. I try to teach them how to be creative with money instead of reacting to money. Because if you react to money, you'll never have enough. I try to get them to be proactive or creative with time. Because right? that's energy. I try to get them to be set up their new patient process to be creative, not reactive. So if we can develop a, and I would say you are a creator. L look at what you've done. Look at what you're doing. You put things together. You see things other people don't. And, and you, you help people. You know what I'm saying? That's creating. Helping people think differently, look differently, act differently. 
But everything that a dentist can do okay, is either react to the problem or they can create something new or different. So when we bring up the insurance issue, insurance was a help at one time. Now it's a definite detriment to most people for most situations. What, what, the, what the insurance does is it sort of speak cancels out that creative process. Well, Doc, I'm only going to do what the insurance will pay. What? Huh? Wait, you mean you're not in charge? See? So that's the insurance company's vision or idea that you won't do very much. To me, it just thwarts that process. So when I see people at any age, at any time, and I'm talking about 60-year-olds, I'm talking about a 60-year-old dentist that's frustrated and has almost given up, I see them change overnight. All they have to do is be creative. Now, some people are going to be reactive, and you, you can't get them into that orientation. Father. They just want this fix. That they don't have any future in mind. They don't, they don't care. And that's okay because the creators can react, but reactors have a hard time creating. So I would say the major problem that we're facing, and I believe this with my whole heart and soul, the major problem anybody faces, whether young or old, is they get into a reactive problem-solving orientation. We all have to react, but I would say the more the person can create, the more they're going to move ahead. And people want, patients want that. If I can help, if you can help me, let's say I'm your patient, and you can help me get what I want, right? you're going to get what you want. Right? I remember I was at ASU uh, maybe 25 years ago, and Lei Coca spoke. So I went over there for one of those leadership things. And he stood in front of the office and he said, his audience, and he said, to the degree you help other people get what they want, you're going to get what you want. And he said, first of all, if you're selling anything, you got to figure out what the hell they want, and then you got to bust your ass to help them get it in language only he could use. So that's our problem. We're not focused on helping the patient create a picture or a vision in their mind of what health is. Right? We're focused on finding out what's wrong and fixing it. And the insurance company is aiding and abetting that. But any one of us at any time, smart or old, poor or rich, black or white, Catholic, non it doesn't make any difference. It's not religion, it's not age, it's not, it's not race. Anybody at any time can choose to create. And when they do, their life changes forever. I don't care how much debt somebody has, they can still create. Does that make sense? Nice rant, that was beautiful. <laughs> Everybody just hit pause, <laughs> rewind, and listen to that part again. You know, um, Ryan and I have been filming podcasts. We just uh, got done lecturing in, uh, I mean, it's amazing. Um, United States election, you know, I don't want everyone to talk about religion, sex, politics, yeah. violence, but. Bernie Sanders was, you know, out there saying all healthcare is free. We were in Tokyo, London, and Paris, where the insurance from the government gives you one hundred dollars for a molar root canal, and you, I mean, could, and it was like gives the dentist a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, and the, these people would n wouldn't go on record to say it, but right. they're like, well, if you're only getting a hundred dollars for a root canal and you're getting ninety dollars to pull it, you just pull it, sure. And, and the dentists in Japan were saying, you know, it just really irks them that these people pull up in Toyotas and Hondas and Lexus and then expect, well, whatever the government pays. And then you cross the ocean and go into Singapore where there's no insurance in right. Singapore. And they're like, they don't even understand insurance. Like, well, you bought your iPhone. Why wouldn't you just buy your dentistry? And why would the government be subsidizing you to drink sugar and not brush and floss your teeth? Why, you know, subsidizing yeah. decay, they thought was, uh, but, but anyway, um, so it, it's amazing uh, how many people are in the mindset that they have to do whatever the insurance is. And when you and I got out of school, um, all 20,000 dentists in UK took the NHS. Yep. And now it's exciting to see about 5,000 of the 20 have said, go to hell. Yeah. I'm not doing a root canal yeah. for $100. Right. I, I can't do a root canal like I do on my own kid for $100. Hell, the supplies Mm -hmm. Cost a hundred dollars, so uh, that's it. Okay, so I want to ask you more specifics because we know that podcasters are young. Yeah. Uh, truthfully, do you listen to podcasts? Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. Okay, you're young in heart then. Uh, uh, but, but I uh, do. But they, they they have some spe very specific questions I want to go to. They they all come out of school. We just graduated six thousand dentists right. in fifty six schools. And they all say, Howard, they, I didn't learn 
I didn't place one implant. I right. didn't do one ortho course. I didn't do one Invisalign. Yep. And um, and they're they're saying they want to learn all these things, but um, um, Panky, Dawson, Koi, Spear, these are expensive yep. uh, to learn how to place implants and Invisalign. There's just all these things, and they're they're kind of like a kid in a candy store. And um, what kind of order? What would you do first? Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, so, some of them think, well, I'll be successful if I um, go to meet Aaron Garg in Dominican Republic and learn how to play simple. And some say, well, I'll go successful if I buy a $150,000 sharing machine. Some say, well, uh, maybe I should learn ortho and Invisalign. And all the, all the they have all these things. But I want you to walk them up the stairs. So they're on the first floor, and they need to get to the second floor. Which steps would you take up the stair uh, in what order? And also explain to them what, what you do. What, what Well, are, what... I, you know, I think that if I look at people that have been significantly successful that I've worked with. Can I use that as a, um, I think that uh, financial control trumps everything else. I think financial control is the key. Because if I get behind the curve, I get behind the curve financially. Um, and I've never been there with patients in my life. I've never let the money determine what the treatment plan. And I, I understand I'm blessed by that, but that was a determination I made. I think that, that from, a, from a management standpoint, you have to choose a model, a, a model, a management model. Is your management model gonna be patient-centered or is it gonna be production and volume-centered? I think that's something that really, that comes from the way we're raised, that comes what our values are, that comes from the people we hang out with. Mm -hmm. And I think by, by far, the most common model, and you, you, you're as familiar or more familiar with this as I am, the most common model is high production high volume practice. So it really doesn't make any difference uh, how much training I get in anything, you know, technical training. If, I, if I'm not spending enough time doing an examination, diagnosis, and a treatment plan, helping the patient engage in it, what difference does it make? So let me go back and, and just mention a couple things. From a dentist, remember, I'm still a dentist and I practice dentistry, okay? I don't practice a lot anymore, but I do. The untreated, undiagnosed disease in dentistry is occlusal disease. The untreated, undiagnosed disease is occlusal disease. When you look in somebody, almost everybody has wear, right? Almost everybody has, so even if you're gonna do Invisalign, you gotta be concerned about where the teeth are gonna end up when you get done, right? and that's gonna be one of the problems that you're gonna have with, like you say, you could take an impression, send it into Invisalign and bring it back. I think that's a huge problem, but that's, that's neither here nor there. I don't think people can self-treat themselves, their occlusions, so that's one thing. Um, another big area in dentistry and is, is, is TMJ, as you know. There's a huge amount of people that have joint problems, muscle pain, facial pain, head and neck pain. And another thing that's really come uh, uh, along is, and, and you know this too, is minimally invasive dentistry. If people want as little dentistry as possible, right? Even, even John, my good friend John Coyce will say, the worst thing you can do to a tooth is crown it, okay? You've now destroyed it, okay? So the least amount of dentistry we're able to, we have the materials, we have the resins, we have the composites today, and we can do a lot of really long-term, long-term, excellent dentistry for people and do it with minimally invasive techniques instead of cutting all these teeth apart. Right? That's another thing that has a very, very strong movement. In other words, the movement to less is more, less treatment is more, is better. Now, a lot of these, a lot of that treatment that I do in minimally invasive dentistry is not, not paid for by insurance. They're not, they're not gonna pay to, to put composite on your teeth to make your teeth fit together. They're not gonna do that. Right? So the other area that you know, it's not very popular, it's not, is this issue of toxicity in dentistry, amalgam mercury toxicity. We see people thriving in those kind of areas. So I think what's gonna, what's gonna happen is each one of these young doctors has to say, you know, what, how do I differentiate myself? How do I distinguish myself? Let me go back to one other thing. Um, thick versus thin. There, there's a thick market and a thin market, okay? Now I would say, thick means there's a lot of people demand for a few users. I would say 25 years ago, 
you know, remember, I was trained as a periodontist, so I've done a couple thousand implants. It's not like I haven't done You're implants. a periodontist? Yeah, I was trained initially as a periodontist. I was in grad school at Iowa on a part-time basis for three years when I was in Dyersville, that little town. Were you born and raised in Iowa? No, I was born in Minnesota, or okay. actually Nebraska, but my childhood was in Minnesota. And we eventually moved to Dubuque. But if, if I look at this and I think, okay, so if, it, if initially, 25 years ago, we would say the implant phenomenon was thick. Right? There weren't very many people doing it, and they had, you know, and there were a lot of people demanding. Over a period of time, what's happened is the implants have been become thin. Everybody's doing them. When I talk to a general dentist, okay, I talk to a general dentist, I've talked to hundreds of them. I've, they have some implant training, they have a cone beam, and I say, how many implants a month are you doing? Oh, I average about four. Are you kidding me? I mean, I have a periodontist, good friend of mine. He does 150 implants a month. Okay, he doesn't do four a month. I mean, you, you know, we get all this this assets, these physical assets, to do so little. So implants have become thin. Okay, I, I think Serac, when it first came out, was thick. Following, it's become. Thinner. It's hard to get into a practice in Florida that doesn't have one. I've been in practices that have two of them. Okay, so it's not evil, but it, you don't differentiate yourself with the CEREC. I talked to a young dentist in Florida, and I said, "Well, he was a son of a of a client of mine." So I sat down and him. So how are you going to differ? Oh, I've got a CEREC. I said, "No, that's not going to differentiate you. If you want to use one, that's fine, but that's not going to be what's going to make your practice." Every young dentist has an opportunity to join that 5% group. Remember Dawson used to lecture on the top 10%, that was his big deal. Well, it's not top 10%, it's top five. So how are you gonna, you're asking, how do, I, how do I get there? What's the first step? Get control of money, get control of time. Decide a direction. Get around some, some good mentors that can say, what do you really want? Where do you want your practice to be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now? And then do your training track, because I have de general dentists that are, that are uh, implant specialists, and they're thriving, but they've focused the last 10 or 15 years of their life, you know, really getting all the training they need to do, and they built like many specialty practices, but they aren't in big cities. They're in smaller areas. They're in areas of North Carolina, and maybe South Carolina, and there's some in Michigan. Or they're not like in Detroit or someplace where they're competing with everybody else to do the same things. That makes sense. So, or would you be telling these young grads that demographics matter? Oh, absolutely, they do. I, I mean, I they all, they think, all know that they think, wouldn't leave the United States and go to Somalia no, or the Congo. No. Um, but it seems like whenever they graduate school, they're always saying, I'm going to North Scottsdale. That's where all the rich people are. They all have money. I, I've always said, and, and this has been my experience, that the wealthiest dentists in America are in small towns. I know it. I believe that with my whole heart. <laughs> I, I talk it. to them. I see them. In Heartland, um, Heartland is the largest chain of yes. corporate. They have 1,500 offices. And Rick stole that page right out of Sam Walton of Walmart. Uh, Sam and his wife Helen realized that uh, Gibson, Sears, TG and Y, none of them were going to go to small towns. Right. And Sam actually went to Dallas and Iowa and met Mr. J.C. Penny, and he said, "Well, me and my wife, we don't want to invest in a store if you're going to come set one up." And they go, "Where are you?" And he said, "Bentonville, Arkansas." And they'd all start laughing. And Sam realized that half of America was supposed to just shut up and take a catalog. Yeah but you're not going to get a real store so sam was in 32 states before he went to a major metro and um in heartland um rick workman would call the insurance company and says where are you selling insurance and you're getting complaints that there's no dentist and they give him every time you call him they give him a list of 10 cities with no dentist he was at 500 offices before he went in a town that any of us would even recognize right. but they all want to go to north scottsdale right well, I think, I think young people want to be around young people. They want to be socialized. They want, but I, you know, I think that trend, and, and I, I don't have anything immediate to quote, but things I've read, I think there's a movement in this country towards smaller communities. I think the quality of life, not, not that you can have a great, but the quality of life is different in a smaller community. I mean, you were, you were raised in Wichita, which I would call a small community, and my key years that I remember were Dubuque, Iowa, Dyersville. Dyersville was a little town in Dubuque. And I still have, and Laura knows, I still have this big pull to go home. Why? 
I go back to Dubuque, I swear to God it's true. I'm not in a store for an hour and two or three patients come, are you Mike Schuster? Can I remember when you took care of me? I mean, it's, it's different. In small towns, I think a smaller community, I'd say not just, not a bedroom, maybe a community that's within 30 or 40, 50 miles of a large city. You know what I'm saying? So you can still go in and shop, you can still do those things. You, you get a quality of life that we don't even have in, in larger cities. It's, I w- that's what I would tell somebody. And I think if they're walking out of school at 25, the, the biggest three game changers that I see for the, for the millennials is that um, you know the, the big utility companies are trying to make everybody think that wind power is these big 100, 300 right, right, foot yeah. deals. But I grew up in Kansas, wind power was used in a little windmill to pull water out of right, the ground. Right. So we're all gonna have little bitty windmills and solar on the roof. But these driverless cars, you know, um, when you're at home, it's hard to get stuff done on your computer when all the kids are this. Then when you go to work, yeah. everybody wants to come by your cubicle and tell you what you do this weekend. And I think the driverless car is gonna push everybody way out because they'll actually like a two hour commute because they can leave their crazy home, they can sit in their <laughs> little box with no windows with a driverless car, and they get all their email done, they can they could lay down, they could take a nap, they could watch a movie. And I think driverless cars are gonna be a complete game changer and push people way out in rural. But I, I noticed in California, like when you go from San Diego to Monterey, um, if you can see the ocean, there's about a dentist for every 300 people. Yeah. And then by the time you get an hour inland, a lot of these people are in one to 6,000, just million dollar practices. Um, I, I have actual classmates that um, wanted to live in uh, against the ocean, but they, they practice uh, four 10 hour days in Bakersfield. And then Thursday after work, they get in their paid off black Porsche and drive into LA, then live like a rock star Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then, then drive home. So yeah, I think demographics matter. I want you, you mentioned TM, TMJ or TMD or cranial mandibular. Um, I just one thing, just but, one. but, but you, you opened up a big can of worms up because they have a lot of specific questions on that. Um, they believe that, um, there's two camps and one is neuromuscular right. and you got to buy a tech scan and yeah, these right, other things. Right. And one is more what they call CR. Uh, Pinky Dawson, what have you, um, and they 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 got to make a decision. Do they go neuromuscular or CR? What what would you say to that? You're really trying to put me in a corner, aren't you? Well, I know you. I I know it's tough to throw anybody in a bridge, but they they ask that question all the time because okay. they 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 believe it's it they believe it's L.A. or New York. Do you do you believe the camps are the same, or do you believe they're different camps? Well, or I, different religions or different I, schools I of think, thoughts. I think it's different schools of thought. Yeah. And then and they want You know, I'm one of these people that believes God's in every church and every temple. I mean, I'm an equal opportunity employer. I have, um, when I moved here to Arizona uh, from, from Iowa, I was on the faculty at the Pankey Institute. I taught there for 11 years. Okay. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah, absolutely. I, part, part, I knew that. And I was down Hell there yeah. like a week a month. I know more about you than you than you. No, know, but, but I mean, that, that was. And and when, so when I moved out here, by the way, when I when I moved out here in '87, there were two gods in town. There was Michael Schuster and Omar Reed, and you guys mm-hmm. were the major headliners at every. Convention. Well, he was a headliner. Come on, I'm just I'm the small no, potato no, guy. No, I mean, no. When, when, when I would go to a different city, and I'd say yeah. I was from Phoenix, they'd always say, "Oh my God, that's where Mike Schuster lives. That's yeah. where Omar Reed lives." Well, let me just say that I my, and Jim and Naomi Road, yeah, were smart practice. I love them. Yeah, love them. Naomi yeah. was a very good friend. She was Omar's sister, you know, and and she was a um, member Marble. of the uh, national speaker. Marvelous. So she was speaker. the president of the NSA. She yeah. could uh, she, she was, could make a whole room cry, then uh, laugh, then yeah. cry, then laugh. But, she was amazing. But yeah. To answer your question, I am a CR guy. Um, I stabilize people's occlusions before I do restorative dentistry, and I do it with a, a an appliance. Okay, and I um, kind of like Frank Spear, and I'm not speaking for Frank, so please don't let me speak for him. Um, I'm not um, a myomonitor person. I, I have it has to work because there's people that are using it, Howard, and getting results. But that's not the path that I take, and to, uh, and that's not the path I teach. Okay, I, I'm more involved with um, uh, Bob Lee. Are you familiar with uh, bioaesthetics? Bob Lee is that a, a lab? No, Bob Lee was a dentist in California. He's an anthologist who developed a, a concept of of, of of health, what I would call health-centered dentistry. Okay, um, so. 
I think Dawson works. I think Panky works. I definitely think what John Coyce is teaching works. Following, but they're all Panky, Dawson, Coyce, Spear, Face from California. You remember them? Uh, OBI and my good friend Hal Stewart of the Texas Academy. They all teach CR. Okay? They teach different ways to get there. They have little different pathways to to get there. So I would say. Uh, if I talk to a young man and they ask me what I thought, like you're just saying, what do you think? I don't have a lot of experience with neuromuscular dentistry. When I, I started to say when I came here, I did a lecture, I think the second year I was here, I was one of the keynotes at the Arizona meeting, and I talked a whole day on TMJ. Okay? And the board was filled with uh, myomonitor people. They came after me over a patient. I said, you guys must not have attended my lecture. Okay? And they looked at me and I said, well, they were they they wanted to drown out anybody that had the CR thing. So I think they're two camps, and probably they both work. Probably, but I'm familiar with the with the CR camp and how that works because I've done Howard 1,325 full mouth reconstructions. Dang, that's the whole mouth, and that doesn't say with partials. And and in a, I, I I'm not taking this as a speaking assignment, but my claim to fame is I've never been sued. I've never been, to, nobody's ever taken me to court over anything. And you can look that up. I've never been sued by anybody, which to me, doing that much complete dentistry means it must have pretty much worked. Right? So I stay with what works. And if I've got somebody in CR, when I start the case, I tell them we're never gonna get lost. We're gonna go through this thing step by step and we can always go back if we get kind of out of, it's kind of like the, um, the never lost thing with, with, the, with the car rental agency. Yeah. So. You ask me, that's what I would say, but that's my opinion, okay? And that's, that's the, like I tell people, I can only tell you what I've done and what's worked for me. I can't tell somebody what they should do. I've only had to deal with lawyers one time and I got my butt kicked, but that was my ex-wife. But, uh, <laughs> you know, never, never stay married 20 years. And uh, I'm just kidding, but uh, no, I'm telling the truth. Hey, um, <laughs> so, so what happens when, uh, so, so, uh, some of these kids might not be familiar with what you do. So if you go to schustercenter.com, um, what what are they going to find on your website, and what is it that you do? Okay. What what do you do at well, Schuster there, Center? There, actually, on the website, there's like 12 or... By the way, my Mimi hates it when I'm yeah. talking to someone else. Whenever I'm spending any time with someone else, she's always got to get my face. So this is my Mimi's way of saying, who's this hey, Mike Schuster guy? attention to me. I'm sorry that Mike Schuster's here um, stealing your attention, my Mimi. But what, so what do they, what do they find at schustercenter.com? That's S-C-H-U-S-T-E-R center.com in Scottsdale, Arizona. Well, they'll find at least 12 webinars that are up on the site that they can watch. They'll find 20 videos, uh, 15 or 20 minute videos that kind of explain the step-by-step -step of going through building up a, a business at work. And, and can I, and can I, yeah. can I uh, spank you on yeah. that issue? Yeah. This, this is my only thing that I've always thought, uh, um, Bank me. Well, on Dental Town, um, we, we we started that in two thousand. Uh, no, nineteen ninety eight. It has two hundred and seventeen thousand dentists. Right. And you and I lived out here yeah. where University of Phoenix online. Yeah. You know, I was driving by that, and it yeah. took. I had to drive by it a hundred times before yeah. I thought we should. Do that. But um, we put up three hundred and fifty one hour courses and the millennials have viewed them six hundred thousand times mm -hmm. and i love your website and i love this but i think the best free marketing you could do is put one of those webinars on on the online ce and then you could say you know we got 12 more of these on dental town because it'd be just be massive marketing you know they they could they could see Mike the man, see what it's all about, and then, uh, but anyway. You mean you're talking about putting that on yours? Yeah, you've already got the content. Oh, well, it's fine, just yeah. do it. Yeah, we, you, we don't have already, any problem with that. You, you already got the content, we but don't, I would uh, see Dentaltown yeah. as just a distribution. Yeah. I mean, I would it, just. I mean, and, absolutely. And, and the millennials also, um, the millennials also, they uh, they don't even use PCs. It's all yeah, on their I, iPhone. I know, I know. So we put the 350 courses yeah. Uh, on, uh, but yeah, you should take, uh, you've already got the content. Uh, I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com, right. and we got another Howard, Howard Goldstein, so he's Hogo at Dentaltown.com, but you should email Hogo and let him see those videos and put one of them up on there. Be an hour teaser, be an hour teaser, and then it's like, if you want, you know, more. but anyway, but, but tell them, they're, um, the podcasters, they all say the same thing, they have an hour commute, 
And those are commuting to work. So tell them specifically what you do. If they went to the Schuster Center, what is it that you're going to do? Are you going to teach them clinical dentistry, practice management? What, what, what do you do? I don't, I don't really try to um, teach clinical dentistry. I probably should have years ago, but I thought I, it was just too much. You know, and if I got into answering questions every day about what material should I use, what anesthetics should I, would take away from helping them develop the process that I have is what you'd call a practice development, but it's also a personal development process. You can't go any farther in life than you are, right? So they're, and so they get engaged, and so they learn how to be creative or proactive with money and then they get time then and it's about getting control and I don't mean you can control everything but the foundation of a business is money time and organization those are the three foundations now what grows the business the growth of it is the business of sales and marketing and relationships and doing something distinctive or different but you said money time and organization okay go go go, go. so would you say that's what you try to focus on is money? Well, that's a start. Oh, that's, that's a start. That's like a foundation. When you build a house, you got to design, but you got to build a foundation. You got to, you know, you test the soil, you build the foundation, then you build the walls, and then you build the roof. And, and so that's, I've used the same thing when I talk to patients about building mouse. First of all, we got to do a plan, we got to make a design. And then we got to build upon. We got to be sure the perio is healthy. We got to be sure decay is out. Now we can start thinking about what are we, where are you going to be long term. In other words, build a foundation, uh, not and not jump to something else or just fix something and leave the rest of the mouth to be diseased. We want to put the fire out before we start shingling the roof. That was a statement that Barclay made a hundred years. Bob Barclay, who was my first mentor, so he I went down in an airplane, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And it was around where you were from. Minnesota. Well, he was from was Macomb it? and I was in Dyersville. But didn't his airplane go down like Iowa or Minnesota? It went down from Chicago to Macomb. It, it was a commercial airplane and it had an oil leak and the cabin filled with smoke and the, and the guy who was flying the airplane couldn't, couldn't see where he was going. But where was, he, where was he from though? Macomb, Illinois. Okay, he's from Illinois. And where'd the plane, what state did it go down? To? I think it went down in Illinois. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I know he was, I know a, he was killed in 77. Yeah, what a legend. Yeah, he was a great guy. But does that make sense? I mean, we, we from our perspective, we help them build a business model. Right? The business model, if you think about this, the business model is what determines whether you do your professional model, which is what the patients look like when they leave. So I may have all of this training up here to know how to do this, but if I've got the wrong business model, if I've got a commodity model down here, I'm never going to get this stuff off the shelf. So I've got to slow down, really understand how to connect, communicate with people, find out what they really want, and move forward. And that's, it's, it's not simple, but it's not complicated, probably. It's not complicated. If you take it, it's like building anything. You've got to do it in a step-by-step -step process. Right? Isn't it funny how when you go around the world, I mean, it's like... What was that game where the frog headed pop up and you try to smack it down? Whack a mole. Well, Isn't it kind of like <laughs> whack a mole? Like, um, like um, you know, the government was going to give all health care free and like, you know, England and France and Tokyo and now the root canal is down to $100 and people are saying, well, the government doesn't buy your house. Imagine if the government bought your car. Imagine if just a fast food hamburger was the government. There were no different McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and Carl's Juniors and all. It was just a government hamburger shop. Um, do you do you think that um, going from indemnity to PPO that it's basically a race to the bottom where dentistry is just a commodity and then eventually it'll hit the bottom and start coming back up where people will think. You know, I paid cash for an iPhone. I'd rather have dentistry done once and right. You know, that's a tough question to ask. I think you you said demographics earlier. Um, I think people, my experience, people that are that are moving towards health, right? If somebody, if I can help a patient get a picture in their mind of what health looks like and have them move towards that, and some of that, they've got to take, see what you're talking about with all this other stuff is somebody else is taking responsibility for me. I'm not taking responsibility for myself. The government's going to do it for me. The insurance company's going to do it for me. Somebody else is going to do it for me. So the idea of health is only something I can give myself. You, you can't, like my wife will say, I'm not your food police. I mean, I have to determine what I put in my mouth, whether I smoke, smoke and drink or what I do, right? How many candy bars I have, right? Or how many Snickers I have. That's my choice. So we, people that are moving towards health are the ones that make the decisions to take care of their mouth. The, the ones that aren't moving towards health, 
So when you talk about young people and you ask these things, you know, is that a question? Yeah. So if they go to your website, so is it? Um, it doesn't say all of these individual things right. on the website. But I mean, do you do you? What would be the what would be the introductory thing to get to know the Schuster Center? What what what's a starting point? I mean, do you, do, you, do you have like level one, two, three, four? Do you have an intro program, yeah, or would yeah. you recommend they go? What, 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 a lot what, of the what would you rec what would you recommend to my homies to learn more about the Schuster Center? I, w I really the, the the website the way it's designed is to is designed with the webinars okay and with the videos to help people get uh, a feeling for who we are and what we do and the offerings and the offerings that we have okay now we don't know however because we're a school just think of we're a school and we have courses okay we actually have courses. We don't know what course that individual doctor needs until we do somewhat of an evaluation of where they are right, in their practice. So, so they may need uh, sales training, and I've developed my own model. But, but how do they figure it out? Do they call you? Do they email yeah, we, you? We talk to them. It's kind of like acting as a counselor for them. Just say, where are you? But, but would that we be the point of entry, a phone call? Yeah, or any, a yeah, phone call? And yeah. what phone number is that? Uh, 800. It's right on that. Right on the so four eight zero nine four one nine three nine three four eight zero nine four one nine three nine three. Uh, everybody has toll free numbers for uh. Or there's things. Or one eight hundred eight nine seven six four seven three one eight hundred eight nine seven six four seven three. Um. Or w and what's the best email? Is it is it you, Laura, Joe? Or are you? I absolutely. Start with me as the marketing manager. That's great. And is Laura Joe at cfpd.com CFPD stands for Center, Center for, for Professional Development. Center for Professional Development. See, I was thinking of you as the Schuster Center, but now it, is is it the Schuster Center or the Center for it's Professional? Schuster Center is the website. Is Center for yeah. uh, Center for Professional Development com. But well, so let me, let me ask it another way. What are you know in in uh, business school they always talk about yeah. case studies? Yeah, like like who's calling you? What are problems that you're seeing in the real world? What are people calling you up and coming to see you? What are what are their cases and what what are you? How are you helping them? Well, what what's a tip? Every time, what's the most typical case study? Or every is there every a time we do a webinar and we do two of them a month. Okay. We ask the doctors, what is your main concern? And that's very helpful because that kind of tells us, this is my main concern right now. And I would say 50% of the concerns that, that the doctors list, and Laura gives me this list and we go over them just to kind of get in touch with it, 50% of them has something to do with insurance or, or not insurance. Uh, some, another big percentage has to do with um, patients are not moving forward with treatment. Or another one is I, I don't have enough new patients. They're all, many are looking for more new so, patients. So it's a, you said number one was insurance some, issues? Th some insurance related issue. My patients insurance? will only do what the insurance will pay for, da 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 da. Number they, two was case acceptance? Case acceptance. And, and number three is marketing? Oh, new patients, Wanting more new patients. I need more, more, new, more new patients. Yeah. I'd say those are the top three, wouldn't you, Laura? Absolutely. And, and then we will have people that, um, and they bring up in conversations just exactly what you said, because you're all, you're all over it, you're on it. You know, my costs are increasing. How does this work? My costs are increasing and my, my fees are going down. How does that work? And you know, one of the things that I have been thinking about, if, if, if I were a young dentist, I would say, how do I insurance proof my practice? How do I corporate proof my practice? Because, you know, just driving down here from Scottsdale, you know, I just I knew we were going to talk, and and I knew it was going to be stimulating. I hope it's stimulating for you. Yeah, it's for been me. a blast. But you know, and you see all these corporate boxes, and, and to think that, and I, I and to think that corporations, I mean, we need corporations. I mean, the thing with corporations, this is really interesting. Stay with me on this line of thought, and you'll get this on George Lamps. Um, uh, he, he, he talks about in his TED talk, he said, it's like we made factories and then we made schools factories so we could have people that would work in the factories. So what we've done, when you talk about is it dumbing down, what we've done, this whole thing is breeding mediocrity. It's why should I try, why should I become the best dentist I can become if hell if I'm not going to get paid for it? 
you know what you know what I'm saying so I think it's a combination of I've got to get the knowledge okay and then I also think it's social skills I mean if, if you could have you could be the best dentist in the world but if, if you're a jerk and you can't form relationships with people you're still not going to get it off the shelf I don't care how organized you are see so I think that's it's it's a challenge that we didn't have 20 30 40 years ago because if we're graduating 6,000 dentists a year today we used to graduate 4,000 a year probably and as you know, the, there's the, the popular areas, it's over inundated. We, we've got one dentist for every 500 people in Scottsdale. And those 500 people are part time, right? And yet more dentists want to move. People say, well, I want to come to Scottsdale. Good, good. I hope you are distinctive. I hope you're special. I hope you really got something to offer, or you're going to join that. You're going to be like the rest of them that join PPOs, right? So I think that, that, uh, this, what I see when I get these things that come on the, on the, the problems, those are like symptoms. I was, doing a, I was doing a seminar in Chicago 20 years ago. It just sticks in my mind. And there was about 25 people. And I never drew big groups, just usually 30 or 40. And these two dentists are in the back of the room. So I said, I said uh, so I started asking everybody, what's going on? What the problem? Well, God, we practice together. We never have any time to spend planning. We never spend time. And this one was, and I said, you know what, you know what this is? You guys are having a heart attack. These are all the symptoms of a heart attack. These are the symptoms of dysfunctional business. Right? These are the symptoms of a, of a, of a problem-solving business. Because a great business, it doesn't have, it, the problems it has is how do we take better care of our customers? How do we do this? How do we do that? They're not, they're dealing with so many inside problems. Do you follow what I'm saying? They can't deal with the outside problems. So if somebody asks me this question, I need more new patients, I'm thinking to myself, what the hell are you doing with the ones you have now? Fine. If, if you take awesome care of the people you have now, they're gonna go out and, t they're gonna go out and talk about it. They've got, you've gotta be special. It's like my buddy Jack King, who just retired. Jack's like 53 or 54. He's now teaching at, um, at North Carolina. Great guy, love Jack. He says, if I'm going to charge people 30% more, I better be doing 60% more for them. Huh? So one of the issues, just, just to share, one of the issues is we want to make money. You know, we went to dental school. We put in our time. We want to make money. And I think what happens is the inside problems prevent us from understanding that we're really there to solve your problem. We're really there to help you. Huh? You're not there to help me. Huh? That's one of the biggest things I see with with a lot of people they, they this orientation is i'm there you're going to help me the reality is i got to be there to help you and if i have that orient how am i going to make a difference for you that's a game now that's kind of a head, head you could say well that's head talk well but i think how we go in and we face people every day in our in our in our relationships and when we walk in the office what are we really there to do and so if i look at all these prop their symptoms and I know, if, I know this for a fact, and I believe it with my whole heart and soul. If I get into a creative, and creative is like if you and I are working together, it's me helping you bring something into existence that didn't exist for you before. Right? So I, now I'm co-creating with you. And so often I will be creating for myself the relationship I have with my wife or my kids or my staff members individually. Right? So if I get into a creative orientation, I'm going to have a better relationship. So I, I sound like that's a one-size-fits-all, but I'm pretty convinced that's the heart of it. I, I want to go back to more specifics yeah. of yeah. the emails we're getting. So what year did you graduate from dental school, Mark? 66. And how many girls were in your class and how many guys? Three. Three they girls. They were all nuns. Were they I really? went to Marquette. They were three nuns. Nuns that became dentists? They were, di they were nuns, and then they became dentists, yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Wow, my two oldest sisters went straight into the nunnery at high school. I've been a dentist. I'm coming up on a next next year will be thirty years. Yeah, uh, my older sister's been a nun for thirty five years. But I, I want to ask you a specific because yeah. you raised four daughters. Yeah, and I raised four boys. Yeah, we'll uh, when we're off the record, we'll we'll dis discuss horror stories on what was harder, four girls. But here's a very common problem girls have: um, one third in, of these six thousand dental students have other dentists sprinkled throughout their pedigree. Right. right. Their mom, dad, yep. uncle. Yep. Um, it's, uh, dentistry is very family oriented. Yep. It doesn't matter if you're yep. in Brazil. Um, uh, some some of those dentists, Kevin, uh, is it Christian Coachman? Uh, is it 
Christian Coachman, there's 38 dentists alive in his family tree right now today. 38. And it's the same in India, Japan. It's a very yeah, tribal deal. Yeah. So, um, like firefighters. So, so it's two different problems um, um, they're having. She's saying, uh, yeah, I, I, now I'm working with my dad. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God. How do you, how do you confront your dad? Maybe, maybe Lord Chance is right. And then number two, and then number two, <laughs> so, so how do you confront your dad when your dad is uh, maybe he's spending Sargenti root canals and you're like, you're like, he, well, he's my dad. I love him, but how do you confront that? And then overall boys and girls, when I ask the millennials yeah. what their number one problem is, they say, um, staff. Yeah, I mean, they make some cough up blood clots. They 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 say sometimes I you know I I, I wish I could say this to my hygienist. Uh, they don't treat their you know just basically just staff in general. So I, I would say it's people issues. So address you had four daughters. How does a daughter address her dad? And do you help in any of that in the Schuster oh, yeah. if she came to the center with her dad? And then number two, um, we're on this side of the coin, so staff listen to us. Yes, but when you come out of school and you buy a practice for seven hundred thousand dollars and you're you're twenty eight years old, it, they they just it just keeps them up at night. It keeps them up at night more than endo, more than yeah. perio. Yeah, yeah. So uh, well, how well, how do you how do you learn people skills? How do you learn leadership? How do you how does a twenty eight year old girl dentist l learn to lead um, five women? To a pond filled with water. I mean, you know. Well, it, you know, obviously, there's there's no one size that fits all. There's no one answer that fits every situation. You know, um, I, I think that that um, two people, two people, if they're really going to work together, uh, their, their values have to be similar. I always say that to when I'm when I'm talking to potential clients or patients. Most of the patients I treat are referred. Most of the clients that I. Uh, involved with are referred by somebody somebody said well you got to go to mike or do this but and i and the reason i i, I said about the website go to the website see if see if that feels right to you see if you feel like we're, because you know if you get involved with the wrong person whether it's your father or not or brother or sister it's just not gonna go well so as as a young person so to speak gets their gets their big boy or big girl shoes on and they begin to know more about dentistry they're able to really make a deter hey is this really what's in the best interest of this patient or not so from that aspect just talking about that part i think you got to be involved with somebody who whose values are in alignment with yours and you would think it would be the same in a family but it's not always it really isn't always the second piece that you, you, you talk about with staff, I think generally young people, young people, that you, maybe you have a staff, let's say you buy this practice that you mentioned for $700,000. You buy this practice for $700,000. You've got the staff, but they've been working with the other dentists. Right? So you inherited a staff and maybe this dentist is retiring or he's older. And so the staff, so to speak, had a relationship with the other dentist. Maybe they respected him and I come in there and I don't have gray hair yet, you know, and I'm sitting there, I'm a young kid, and that uh, general, generally, I see them kind of being taken advantage of, huh? I see that. So when, when you talk about uh, leadership, I, I think, you know, there's a million books on leadership, you know that as well as I do. What is, it's just like, do you know where you're going? Do you know why you're going there? This is where, this is who I am, this is where I'm going. This is what I want to accomplish. You gotta, you gotta say that to your staff every day. My staff will tell you, I drive them nuts. If I'm on vacation, they have a little thing they play, how many, how many emails are we gonna get from Mike? Because you know? every time I send an email out to people that I know, I, I copy them, because I'm always talking about what are we about, what do we stand for, what are we trying to accomplish? Not that we're perfect, and that anybody that's ever worked with me will tell you that, but I'm doing my best to get here. Does that make sense? So I think you gotta put your big girl boots on or big boy boots on and say, this is who I am, this is what I wanna do, this is how I wanna take care of people, this is what I wanna do with my life, and start marching down that aisle. And I think, again, I'll go back, I think we've been taught to conform, to get along. I mean, that's not you. You, you, you know, you're not a conformist. You've never been one, follow me? You're an out of the box, you know, you can't put Howard in a box, follow me? So we shouldn't be putting people in boxes. We shouldn't be making judgments about what people should or shouldn't do or allow other people to do that. We wanna give people the freedom 
to make their own choice. And I think a young person can get up in front of their staff every morning and regardless of what they say, they can have a, like a little statement or this or that, pull something off of Google, whatever, and just talk about it for a couple minutes. This is, this is why we're here. This is what we're trying to do. This is, you know, we may not be perfect, but this is what we're trying to do. And that's leadership. I mean, you don't have to read 50 books about that. I mean, the books are filled with characteristics. Just frickin' do it, right? Just act like this is who I am and this is who I want to be, and I don't care what age you are. I don't care if you're just out of school. I mean, you can carve, they can carve a place out for themselves. I don't think they have to read 50 books. You know, that, that act as if and you'll become it, huh? You know, act as if and you'll become it. And you gotta speak it, and you gotta act it. And the strongest force for movement isn't talking, it's modeling. Modeling. I mean, you model for your staff. If you want your staff to be there on time, you get in on time. You don't come late, follow me? You're not late for appointments. I'll tell you something that'll, that'll really get, you'll get a kick out of this. So I'm a young kid and I go and start practicing dyers. They just about ran me out of town. I mean, the farmers were tough. So I, had a, I, had, I, I didn't have anything distinctive. I didn't have anything different, but my deal was I'll never be late for an appointment. Okay? My overhead, you're gonna laugh at this, my cost per hour was $64 an hour. So if I was late, I was late. We paid that patient. We paid the patient. We were never late. So I could tell my patients and everybody, I will all, I'll never be more than five minutes late for an appointment. I will always be there. Or the appointment is free. So that was kind of what I was trying to do. And we all got together under that single purpose of timeliness because timeliness has always been important to me and I figured look your time is worth as much as mine I don't care who you are I'm not going to keep you waiting does that make sense yeah I mean that's a little thing but I think it's a big thing that says who am I what am I about I'm here to take care of you as a patient I think anybody can do that I don't care if they're just out of school I don't care what setting they're working in is of course if you don't have control of your appointments and your time that makes it difficult but I still think irrespective of corporate dentistry and everything, I think there's a lot of people that want their own business. I still think there's that desire for to be your own boss, to run your own business. Don't you or not? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so if they go to their website, you have a dozen webinars. I think there's about that many. We just we're gonna, we just so maybe did, so maybe what you should do is you should just tell your dad say, um, hey, let's sit down and watch a third person because you don't want to bring something up to your dad watch some webinars with your dad yeah. and and if you guys have the same values you want to do dentistry better you want quality you want to do dentistry like you would treat other people like you want to treat yourself um if you guys got the same values that that would work and uh but that that was the fastest hour i think i've ever done a podcast uh that was just crazy fast but i just want to say that um i practiced in this man's backyard for 40 years you were a legend when i got here my assistant, uh, I, I told Jan uh, um, that I was doing this today, and she wanted to skip work dental assisting and come here. And I told her no, she had to she had to assist, and she was mad. But uh, you were uh, you did so much for my office. You've done so much for so many of my friends. I don't think I've ever lectured in a city and told someone that I was from Phoenix, or someone didn't say, "Oh my God, that's where Mike Schuster is," or "Omar Reed," or. And um, um, thank you for all that you have done for dentistry. Thank you for all that you continue to do. Thank you for the Schuster Center. And, uh, but you never did answer the most important question. What was harder, me raising four boys or you raising four girls? Since I don't know what your experience was. <laughs> well, uh, he's sitting right you know, there, so I, <laughs> you're pretty tough on I'll him. I'll tell you though, the one well, marvelous thing is how they've all turned out. That's what's great, you know? I mean, they've all just. You know what the main difference is? <laughs> when you have four daughters, you'll have visitors in the nursing home. I. I <laughs> My boys are like, first time I drill on myself, they'll call up the Medicare and say, we got a pickup. Dad's drilling on himself. Can you get him out of here? But, um, but seriously, thank you so thank you. much. This thank is you, a Howard. huge honor that you thank came you. over today.